Chapter 10, we're looking at an explanation really of the framework or structure within which we're going to study the life course for the remainder of the semester. It is called the life course perspective, and it's different in, in some um, small ways and some larger ways from uh, the other kinds of life development structures that that uh, perhaps you've been exposed to during the course of your education. And this chapter is going to explain some of the similarities and differences for you. The life course perspective looks at the effect of factors independently, cumulative, cumulatively, and then also the interactions along biological, psychological, and social dimensions. There is that biopsychosocial perspective once again. I, I think also uh, I would add that it, it includes spiritual dimensions as well. It's a little, uh, I think it's a bit of a oversight that that's not included in this particular chapter. But, but it, it uh, this this perspective places value on human agency. That is the the ability of a human being to take an action to uh, change his or her life course. Those kinds of things. And human connectedness also, how the generations connect together and impact each other during the course of, of, of one's life. So it, the text says, you know, that the life course can be viewed as a, as a path, but, but it's a path that isn't necessarily straight, has a lot, lots of uh, twists and turns in it as, as we go along through our life. So, so maybe typically, you know, when we look at, 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 uh, life development or a person's life over time, you know, we look at those events, uh, those experiences and transitions and things in life and try to understand the person in light of the things that he or she has experienced uh, along those lines. But this perspective also um, brings us to understand how a person's life is synchronized with the family's life across time. Um, again, throughout through the generations and all the different phases the family goes through as well. Uh, it also uh, looks at uh, the uh, interactions between the culture and social institutions, um, both in the present time as well as historically, and how they shape the pattern of our lives. So, so it's really, a, a, I think, a more complex kind of a look at, at the family life course or at the human life course. Historical time, social location, culture all have an impact upon our experience as an individual, and, and those uh, those impacts change as we go through our life. Now, there's a few basic concepts we're going to touch on uh, in in understanding the life course perspective, and here's the list of them right here, and we have a slide or two on each. So your cohort is that group of persons uh, who you were born with during, during the same time period and who experienced uh, the same kinds of social changes within the same culture in the same sequence and at approximately the same age. So basically, these are the people you're born with and, and who, who live in your culture with you and, and go through many of the same larger experiences as you. So for instance, um, you know, I belong to the baby boomer generation. Um, many of you are what were called Generation X or Gen X people, which is that sort of that, um, well, I don't know, the I think the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, th those those births are considered Gen X, and then the Millennials, which are the ones born um, in the 90s and the early 2000s, I believe. And so, so each of these groups of individuals have have certainly had individual historical events that that impacted existence with a capital E, and certainly in, affected each of us as an individual um, as we as we went through our own lives. And it talks about the difference between a cohort and a generation. And uh, for what this is worth, I, I, it, it is becomes a, a, a generation only when it develops a shared sense of its social history and a shared identity. I don't know. You know, I mean, most uh, most uh, when we talk about generations, like the previous generation, everything, usually we're thinking, I think, in terms of 20 years, uh, you know, people born 20 years apart, although certainly, you know, um, Many people around, many places around the world, you know, that, that generation probably be more like 30 years, but uh, that's, well, it's not necessarily an, an amount of time as it is, a, again, a cohort, but a cohort that, that uh, really can kind of look back and say they shared certain things. And each of these groups, as I mentioned, face these unique historical and cultural forces 
and, and sometimes have to develop certain ways of being in order to cope with those forces. Um, and, and the good example in the book is the population pyramids, you know, and um, it's um, exhibit uh, 10.2. It's very interesting to note how, you know, the, the comparison of male and female and, and um, also uh, the age, age ranges, you know, when you look at the less affluent countries, of course, there are many, many more uh, persons of younger age and, and coming to a really quite a pyramid, you know, with the elderly people. Whereas when you look at the more affluent northern cultures such as our own, it's 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 almost like a column as opposed to a pyramid. And, and you kind of get a sense a little bit about how what um, population control has done in some respects for, for um, well, at least how that's impacted us. And I suppose there are pluses and minuses to each of those pyramids. It's interesting to note, like when they talk about the sex ratio and how how they affect the cohorts, marriage rates and childbearing practices and crime rates and and the stability of the family system and things like that, as well as how it might impact the economy and the culture. Um, there are is an estimate that there's 105 males born for every 100 females in the world, and actually at the point of conception, I've read that the the ratio of males to females is even higher. The male uh, zygote and the male embryo are apparently, and, and they think it's because, I think because of the Y chromosome, that it, there's some vulnerabilities in that Y chromosome that don't exist in the X chromosome. And so um, male embryos are more at risk to not be born, basically, than female embryos. And then at the time of birth, there are more males than females still, and yet... Uh, during the course of, of the life, uh, more males meet an earlier death. Um, and so uh, by the time I think, uh, you know, there's a certain age where they go where the females actually outnumber males uh, in, in the population, generally speaking, uh, males die at higher rates at every age. And, and of course, war and things like this has something to do with that, but it is also involves other kinds of things as males are notorious for engaging in in um, more risk-taking behaviors than females, socially speaking. Transitions is another concept. The, the transitions represents changes in roles and statuses uh, that bring about a distinct departure from prior roles and statuses. So this, the transitions we're talking about here really is a process of gradual change, and, and usually it involves you know, it's either acquiring or letting go of roles and things. So things like they say here, starting school, you know, going through puberty, entering the work world, moving uh, either within your nation, within your country, within your culture, or to a new culture, uh, retiring, those kinds of things. These are life transitions, and I think these are particularly important in some of the other models we have for mapping the life course and life development and things like that. But uh, again, this is just one part of this, this particular perspective. Trajectories is a longer view of, of patterns of stability and change in a person's life that involve many different transitions. So for instance, uh, at some point in your high school career, perhaps you made the decision that you were going to go on to college or at some point and you go on and you get your bachelor's degree and perhaps you work for a little while and then you move on to your master's and and uh, once the master's is completed, you enter the work world and begin to build your profession, join professional organizations, those kinds of things that, that further firm up your identity. This is a this is a trajectory and there are many trajectories, you know, because we live in many different spheres, we involve we you know we have many different roles and and so so um, our our life course really has a lot of multiple intertwined trajectories and as this uh, slide points out usually you know you can see that trajectory better in the rear view mirror as opposed to one where you can sense that you're in the middle or that you're in a trajectory at this moment a life event is um, a significant occurrence that in that is is kind of represents really a more abrupt change and and still can produce very serious and long-lasting effects for instance you know the the death of a, of a partner is a life event um, but it also pre precipitates a transition that involves changes in roles and status so you see how the life events sometimes mark beginnings and ends of of um, of well trajectories and and transitions and things like that now there, you know, there's a lot of discussion about 
or a lot of examples, I think, of the of um, scales or whatever that can help you gauge the amount of stress you're under because of the uh, the the life events that you've experienced and how it impacted you. And these scales tend to have a negative focus in and doesn't really look at the fact that positive events can also create stress. And distress can be a positive thing as well. It can be very motivating, you know. But they call it EU 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 stress. Um, as opposed to distress, but but stress of any kind creates wear and tear on our psyche and on our biology and and perhaps our spirituality as well. And so um, this this schedule of recent events is in the textbook kind of gives you an example of one way to kind of rate these events. Now, what is the significance of this? Maybe if you you know you have clients that that are going through a lot of changes and they're experiencing a good deal of stress, sitting down with a scale like this that might help them understand that some of these things that have gone on in their lives, which, you know, even if they're predictable, such as the, the uh, you know, departure of a child uh, to go to school or, you know, move out or whatever that might be, um, that all of these things uh, can accumulate and, and cause an individual to experience more stress than normal. And of course, as it points out here, you know, these life events, some of them have different meanings depending upon who the person is and where they live and what their life perspective is. Turning points um, may be like life events, but, but these, are, these are times when a major change occurs in the life course trajectory. So some event occurs and, and uh, this, this uh, turning point occurs. And, and sometimes you hear it referred to as defining moments so that these are lasting changes, not not a not a temporary detour. And again, sometimes these turning points are only only really noticed or understood until time has passed and one looks back on on uh, on their life. This um, your life course trajectory takes a shift at this time, and and uh, sometimes you know these turning points can bring you back on track. Sometimes it pushes you off track, and there are studies that suggest these cluster at midlife. But I I suppose the studies are studies, you know, so I I, I can't uh, you know argue that necessarily. But it seems to me that turning points can occur at many different points in our life. Um, and, and interestingly, also gender difference as well. Not surprising that, that uh, women tend to report more turning points embedded in family domain, whereas uh, men tend to report more of them in the work domain. And um, this has a lot to do with the traditional gender uh, roles that we assign males and females, I think, as much as anything. So setting those terms aside or those concepts aside, now we want to look at the some of the major themes of the life course perspective and there are six dominant themes in the life course approach that we're going to talk about here. First, the interplay of human lives and historical time. I was born in, in um, the early 1950s, which means that I was coming of age, so to speak, during the 1960s and uh, early 1970s. And I, I can tell you, just you know how um, well if you if you've studied American history or social history of America in the 60s or if you were around during that time like me I mean you know that there were many large cultural and social shifts going on during the 1960s in part brought about because of the Vietnam War which which uh, sort of was one of those things that hung over me as an adolescent through the 60s and into the early 70s, you know, wondering if I was going to get drafted and what would I do if I, if I was drafted and those kinds of things. Um, earlier than that, in the early 60s was, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, you know, throughout much of my ch childhood, I mean, really, all the way through school, I can remember teachers talking about the possibility of nuclear war. Uh, we in in second grade, I can remember, you know, you hear about the duck and cover exercises. And instead of duck and cover, uh, we were in this old um, old building for elementary school, and the uh, teachers would have us line up in the hallways with our with our hands clasped behind our heads facing the walls, you know, in case of a nuclear attack. We would have these drills or whatever we would do this, I guess, to protect ourselves from the flying glass before we melted away. Um, I can remember uh, 
civil defense drills where we would have to pull down the shades and turn off our lights. Uh, you know, and we would see, I actually see army trucks going up and down the streets of my little, my little town and these kinds of things really, you know, casting a very negative pall over my childhood. And I think a lot of my friends had the same, the same kind of experience with that, you know, and then in, uh, into the sixties, you have the, the hippie movement and, and, uh, you have, um, you know, well, then the space race, which, you know, on a positive side, you know, landing on the moon, going from a, in, within the course of less than 10 years, you know, from pushing somebody up into the atmosphere for 15 minutes to, to actually walking on the moon. And all of these, these, uh, these, the women's movement uh, was, was really coming into full flower during this time. And just so many different things all converging at one time. And, and I think for me, one of the things that it did is is that it kind of created this perception that we could really make a difference in the world and we were going to change things. And if you ever listen to the musical Hair and some of the songs in that, which is from that generation, uh, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. You know, it was the it's it was really a, a time of hope as well as chaos and things like this. And I think it really shaped us, whatever for better or worse, shaped my generation into a certain kind of a. Uh, of a perspective on the world and life that that uh, other generations later on wouldn't necessarily have and this is partly the cohort effect these formative experiences that this slide refers to and 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 how history impacts how we see ourselves in our world uh, then there, and, you know, the same historical events may affect different cohorts in different ways, you know. So it, the interesting thing, while there certainly has been a lot of, um, of um, resistance to the notion of uh, uh, the wars in Iran and Afghanistan or Iraq and Afghanistan, rather, you know, over the years, um, nonetheless, you know, the, it, it seems that the, the Gulf Wars have have evoked a certain patriotism um, and uh, a desire on the the younger generation maybe the gen xers or the millennials to to volunteer and enlist and serve overseas and fight for our nation and things that simply did not exist very strongly at least in my opinion uh, during the during my tenure as a young man being uh, in the group of people that might be sent off to war. So those of us growing up in Vietnam, uh, there was a lot of resistance to that war. And, and uh, we viewed a military service, many of us at least, in very different ways. Now, that's not to say that Vietnam vets didn't serve with honor and, and have the same dedication to patriotism. But I think nationally speaking, there was just a whole different view of war between the 1960s and the and the early 2000s. And, and so there's an effect, uh, an example of how maybe these same historical events affect cohorts differently. And more recently, you know, the economic recession, the wars in Iran and Afghanistan, or Iraq, Iraq uh, I, I know there's a difference between those two countries, I may not sound like it, but between Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, or in Iraq, and, and, and uh, the election of Barack Obama, the first African-American president of the United States, these things are all going to reshape the perspective and perceptions of young people today. There's been a lot of discussion about what uh, the meaning is of, a, of an African-American being elected to the presidency to young African-American boys and girls. You know, it certainly seems to suggest uh, a lot more possibilities than, than that same group might have had 30 years earlier. And this slide points out that, that changes in policy, public policy, are often uh, needed because of social change, and sometimes th those those public policy changes lag behind the social change that's needed. Timing of lives, the our our um, our age, and this says that you know the difference when events occur, and, and as well as where we are in our own life course, you know our age has an impact upon how those things affect us. And what is age? There's different descriptions of age here, really kind of entering into all of the different dimensions of our life. Um, and, and also, even from society to society, age means a different thing. So that, well, as this points out, you know, this age structuring where 
society's standardized ages at which certain social role transitions occur. And of course, the one that comes most readily in mind to me is retirement. Uh, so that, you know, the generally the retirement age is considered to be somewhere between well, 62 and 67, and that's really defined by Social Security benefits. You know, is when when you become available for that. And 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 uh, lately, you know, the the notion of working longer is is in and uh, not retiring at that age is uh, are in part at least motivated by the fact that there's concerns of Social Security. Uh, fund is drying up and we need to work longer before we begin to draw on benefits and things like that. I mean, these these kinds of public policy um, rulings impact how we view what our age means. Whereas if we lived in some parts of Russia, for instance, I think people are still working productively full time in well into their 80s. And it's, you know, it's not even considered that one might not work earlier than that. And so so it really, you know, whereas for us, you know, we worry because we elect a 70 year old man to the presidency and what's his health like and the, and I'm talking physical health, not mental health and, and those kinds of things. Um, so all of this really varies all around the world. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, how our policies and laws uh, regulate how we go through these transitions and when we do that. Linked and interdependent lives are opportunity and misfortune, as, as this text puts it, ripple through the link, uh, r rather ripple through the links families have across generations. That's right. That slide is right. And so, so um, you know, how are we connected to our parents and our grandparents and to our children and our grandchildren, really, uh, when, uh, you know, one, one thing happens in one of those generations it oftentimes has an impact on one of the other generations. So I, I like the fact that it says, while children's lives are influenced by parents' life trajectories, quite obviously, parents' lives are also influenced by their children's life trajectories as well. So, and not only as when they're older, but also at younger ages. So things that kids do also have a way of shaping how, how a parent's life goes forward as well. And sometimes, you know, the, uh, and, and, and uh, this this complicates things a lot that family roles have to be synced across three or more generations sometimes that you've heard about the sandwich generation the the middle-aged individual who's got responsibilities for caring for elderly parents or looking after elderly parents as well as raising kids uh, these are all things that um, create a lot of extra pressure on 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 some persons and not others then there's the links with the wider world, um, the situations in the wider world that, that have an impact upon our own trajectories. Uh, and, it, and this is talking about um, the timing of departure of young adults from the parental home and how changes in the labor market, um, for, you know, whether or not there are jobs available, those kinds of things, the housing market, how cheap or expensive is housing, um, the education system, you know, I, I have taught, and well, I'm sure I'll mention this again to you later, you know, but I taught a course in adolescence, a sociology course in adolescence for years at, at, at KPC. And one of the things I noticed during the, during the years that I was teaching that course is that a whole new life phase was being talked about by the end of that uh, time. And that was the young or the uh, um, emerging adulthood. It wasn't even mentioned um, when I first started teaching this, but uh, the, just as the whole concept of adolescence developed in the early 1900s because, well, because you may remember from your studies in social welfare that there were issues around uh, employment in those days. There, were, there weren't enough jobs for males. And so the whole concept of, of um, mandatory compulsory education and child labor laws came in. They began to differentiate between um, older children and, and young adults so that older children became this new class thanks to Stanley G. Hall and his, and his uh, gigantic work on adolescence called adolescence. And, and suddenly the, these older children were being handled differently judicially and legally and, and socially. And so a new, whole new life phase was recognized out of economic need. Likewise, I think this has occurred through the 90s and into the into the 
the new millennium because very much for economic need once again. Um, so how do we deal with this? You know, children get older children, young adults get more and more education. Many of them continue living with their parents during this time. Many of them haven't haven't really defined their career objectives. So whereas perhaps in the 40s and the 50s, you know, you were expected at 18 to be, you know, to know what you're going to do with your life. I don't know if that's true or not, but, you know, I, I think there's some truth to this at least. And and uh, you were expected to know what was going to happen in your life and you were expected to be working hard to get ready to do to to have your own place, you know, and those kinds of things. Whereas modern day now, you know, there, there are, I think uh, it's not uncommon to find young people in their mid thirties still living with their, with their parents at different times, depending upon the situation. And this emerging adulthood phase has gone from adolescence into young adulthood now. Uh, I, so that I think now, you know, the social expectation, so to speak, is that, Young people really don't have to, aren't expected to have a, a sense of what exactly they're going to do with their lives now until they're in their mid twenties, and 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 um, they're probably not marrying as they did at one time, those kinds of things. And so, anyway, that's just one example of how the education system I think has changed. That you know, where more and more people are getting more and more education, meaning they're not in the workforce, so that's keeping jobs available to other people, that kind of thing. Likewise, the welfare system and the timing of departure from the parental home, what kind of services are out there for young people, you know, and, and uh, the countries and the nations in Europe, uh, particularly the Scandinavian countries, I think the textbook remarks has um, a much younger age when which young people step away from their parents. And that has a lot to do with the fact that institutionally speaking, there's a lot of things in that culture to support that, that uh, separation. May have mentioned this before, but you know, I, my Danish, uh, my German students. You know, you you you're probably aware of this that um, Germans go to school, and they don't have to pay for higher education like like you do. You know, so the only thing I have I have had uh, two of my four German students have gone on to uh, PhD work, and they do that in 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 at very fine institutions in Germany paying about a hundred bucks a semester for administrative fees. They don't pay tuition. It's all taken care of by the government. If, you know, if they were, and they didn't have to necessarily be selected, is that they had to have the, the grades in order to move on. But, but uh, there's a large portion of, 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 those, uh, of those young people who are going on to higher education. Imagine being able to get your doctorate and not have to worry about student loans and, and debt and those kinds of things when you graduate. Uh, my Danish student points out to me, now he's working on his doctorate and, and uh, as well, and, and uh, Denmark actually pays young people, their citizens, to go to, to school. And the, the whole purpose of that is to, uh, well, not the whole purpose, but at least one of the purposes the government says in their program is because they don't want parents to feel like they have to be responsible to pay for the education of their adult children. It's just amazing to me the differences in how societies view these things. And so you can see how it may be easier to leave home in those situations than, than uh, in America. Human agency in making choices. Of course, we, we've talked about agency previously. Uh, personal agency, which is, you know, being able to use our own influence to shape environmental events uh, or through our own behaviors change the course of our life. Proxy agency, where we, we influence others who have more resources to act on our behalf to accomplish goals. And then finally, collective agency, where we, we uh, as a group, on a group level, we band together to meet needs and accomplish goals. Um, Bandura is a psychologist that's been studying human development for years and years and years. And he, he, uh, he says that everyday life really requires us to have all three, all three capabilities. Now, of course, the whole, the whole notion of, of human agency, you know, it, it, certainly in our culture, as compared to per, in an oppressive culture such as China or Russia, perhaps, um, human agency means a lot of different things. And so, you know, our cultural, um, our culture has an impact, but depending upon the historical time, has an impact on our ability to exercise human agency in any form. 
um, the oppressive regimes perhaps in, in the Middle East, you know, would, would uh, certainly restrict the capacity for a personal agency and collective agency for that matter. So, so when we talk about human agency, I think we have to really recognize this is really tied to a culture and to a time. Uh, also, you know, I gave you a handout a few weeks ago on on the different characteristics of individualistic versus collectivist cultures, and I think it's really interesting. I hope you've had a chance to look through that, and uh, I like the way it kind of breaks down all those different uh, those different concepts and how how they differ from one type of culture to the other. And and this, uh, and there are a lot of people who believe that really human agency applies much more in individualistic societies than in collectivist ones as well. So just another dimension in which you can consider the capacity of human agency. Human agency, of course, is one of those things that gives us hope in the social or profession. Diversity in life course trajectories. Uh, not only diversity, uh, actually I should say, not only diversity between cohort groups, but also variability within cohort groups is considered in this particular um, thing. And, and uh, intersectionality, again, is a concept we talked about earlier, but it, it, something to consider here again, because it really does help us understand um, how diversity impacts the life course projectity, pro trajectory. Um, we're, we're always a member of many different socially constructed and largely socially constructed identity groups, even even our age. Um, as we were talking about a few a few slides back, even our age is a social construct in many respects. Aging is a biological process, but age is a social pro is a is a social construct, just like the difference between sex and gender. So, so um, we're all we're all jointly and simultaneously members of a number of different socially constructed identity groups, such as well all the ones that are mentioned here. Um, and, and so um, this has something to do with our life course trajectory as well. And depending on how many minority groups we're involved in and that we're a member of, let's say, you know, uh, may have a more negative impact upon our life course trajectory, uh, whereas those where we're engaged, we're involved or we're a member of the more privileged group in any of those constructs, uh, our life course trajectory is going to look much more positive in, in our particular society at our particular time. So that's what's called our social location. And I, this is another sociology concept. It's our place in society. It's the intersection of all these multiple identity groups. And um, they have their, their uh, elements of privilege and their, their elements of oppression. Developmental risk and protection uh, is, I believe, the last factor that we're going to look at here, a theme. And this is um, it, this really kind of looks at, at uh, risk and, and resilience. And um, I, there are a couple of concepts, Merton's concept about cumulative advantage and cumulative disadvantage, um, that social institutions and social structures develop mechanisms that ensure increasing advantages for those who succeed early in life and increasing disadvantage for those who struggle early. Um, and, and so this, for instance, racial health disparities is one example of this, you know, that uh, uh, I believe it was Alabama, you know, that talked about the, the, um, um, the death rate among infant, the infant mortality rate in Alabama it is so much higher for African American babies than it is for for Caucasian babies. It's it's just unbelievable the difference. Um, that's one example of that. Educational environments. If you uh, read the Jonathan Kozel article, I'm pretty sure I assigned to you on savage inequalities. You probably read it before. Um, there's there's little doubt that. The, where you grow up and, and the quality of that school and the funding for that school and, and really the quality of the physical plant of that school and the safety of that school and different kinds of things like this, all of this combine to either work for or against the students in that school in terms of their life traje trajectory. And so a trajectory Tra tra trajectory of unearned advantage is really what we call privilege. And, and when it's unearned disadvantage, we're looking at oppression, oppression and inequalities. This is, a, this is a good concept to keep in mind. Cumulative advantage, cumulative disadvantage. 
why do we need affirmative action in today's society, you know, when there are so many laws out there that are supposed to protect, you know, equal opportunity? This is one reason. It's only one reason, but it is one of those big reasons. Cumulative disadvantage. Risk factors increase the likelihood of developing and maintaining problems at later stages. Protective factors decrease that probability. Um, sometimes these cumulative processes can be reversed when human agency is exercised, but also with the caveat that the, you know, the cultural uh, cultural boundaries on human behavior, uh, resource availability, environmental conditions all impinge upon the capacity of human agency to really have an impact. But the power of humans in, in an environment where they can actually act, the, the power of humans to use protective factors to assist in this, in this correction process in the face of adversity over time is what we call resilience. So in the family life course, perspective. Families are seen as multi-generational systems moving through time composed of people who have a shared history and a shared future. That's what a family uh, is seen as in this, in this particular perspective. We talked about many different definitions of families some weeks back. Transition points in, in the family life course can be normative. Those are the things like, you know, launching your children and, you know, uh, retirement and those kinds of things. And they can be non-normative where somebody, uh, well, the death of a, of a loved one or, a, you know, the family moves to another job or loss of employment, those kinds of things. Regardless of what causes these changes, these transitions, change is inevitable. And, uh, you know, a, a transition either gives us an opportunity in the family to uh, to adapt positively and grow or to bend and break under the stresses and strains of, of those transitions. Uh, the authors see a lot of different advantages and very few disadvantages to the, to the theories of human development that are offered by the life course perspective that it, it encourages greater attention to the impact of history and sociocultural change in human behavior. I think that's an important, important thing. And, and when you think about Bronfen Brenner's, um, you know, model of, of, um, of the ecology of, of human life and everything like this, you know, this, this, uh, this model actually gives, gives um, some agency, let's say to the, to the, history and culture around us that Bronfen Benner suggests. Intergenerational relationships and their interdependence uh, is also emphasizing this. Um, it, it isn't as deterministic as some other theories. Looks at, at, at resilience and the capacity for change. It's a good framework for culturally sensitive practice and, and uh, it takes into consideration cumulative advantage and disadvantage. Um, some disadvantages, you know, heterogeneity, uh, you know, there's just so many different cultures, so many different people, so many different groups, uh, so many different times and things like this, so that it really is perhaps very hard to assess its validity because of that, you know, to do, to do good scientific studies, let's say, about this perspective. And I don't know that I totally agree with this, but this says that it doesn't adequately link the micro world of the individual and and family um, to the macro world of institutions and formal organizations. So because I, I don't know, it seems to me that it does that, but um, maybe I'm missing something. So what are, what are the implications for our practice? Well, first of all, help, help your client to make sense of, of their life's journey and its uniqueness so they can uh, begin to understand and and maybe improve their current situations you know there's all sorts of different ways of doing that but but to be able to kind of assess where i've been and what's what's impacted me along the way gives me gives me some opportunity to for human agency i mean to to alter things if i want to um Try to understand the historical context of clients' lives and the ways that 
that historical events influence your behaviors. Perhaps particularly important for um, immigrant clients that you may have. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it isn't only that they immigrated and what the experience in general is of an immigrant coming from their culture, but also, you know, when did their family move here? Be when, because again, when you think about cumulative advantage and disadvantage, um, some people coming, let's say, from Asia in the in the 1930s had a very different experience than those coming from Asia in the 1990s. And so, um, or with the Vietnam, you know, the, after the Vietnam War, those kinds of things. Each each time period has different experiences, and and that will that will impact future generations as well. Life event inventories, as I mentioned earlier, can uh, can help a client to begin to recognize the amount of stress in his or her life. Um, understand the potential that how our interventions can sometimes serve as turning points that help an individual or a family. Work with the media to keep informed about the impact of changing social conditions on individuals. Recognize the ways that um, the lives of family members are linked across generations and how the impact of circumstances in one generation ripples onto other generations as well. That in a family system, no person is an island. Um, how the global economy um, affects our lives. Um, research on risk protection and resilience is always uh, something that's very important when you're thinking about prevention programs. I already mentioned the immigrant and refugee families, but aside from the, the cultural impact of their arriving in the country, also what are the age norms in their countries of origin and how that may fit or not fit into the age norms of the dominant culture and how that affects the individuals. And, and again, mind you, remembering that the younger generation is acculturating much more quickly than the older generation. So there's going to be differences within the family as well about age norms and expectations. And I can, see, you know, it's easy to see how that could lead to a lot of conflict in, in uh, immigrant and refugee families. Cultural groups uh, have many different systems of support and, and uh, mutual aid that are something that we want to be able to encourage as much as possible, particularly in times of crisis. Um, and, and then support and help develop clients' sense of personal competence for making life choices, help them find their capacity for human agency and support them in the process of, of taking action to, to help direct their lives. Okay, that's that's it for this chapter. Um, I think it's fairly clear, and there's some pretty good ideas in this particular chapter. I think, in in, in thinking about the life course perspective as we begin now to work through them stage by work through that stage by stage. Thanks very much for listening. Talk to you again.